we're going to talk about masonry strengthening next. And then, uh, Al, you're going to do a little bit. Because, I, I mean, I should get done here right at 4 or maybe a little before. We're, we're, we're officially supposed to go until 4.30. Um, so we're almost, we're almost completed here. So our last topic, or at least my last topic today, is about stabilizing and strengthening masonry. We're going to talk about several different techniques that are available out there. And, and, and some of the methods are, are very simple and some of them are, are, are more complex. And uh, I, th I think really I just want you to be aware of the different methods that are available so that uh, you, if you come up against a structural issue on your historic preservation project, you, you recognize there are some options available. We're gonna talk about external methods, internal strengthening methods, it is possible, and, and some injection methodologies for stabilizing masonry as well. So one of the key things, um, that, that, that I, I try to do, it's not always possible, but, but incorporating the strength of the existing masonry. And, you know, I, probably one of the toughest points that I have in getting across with engineers that are working on old buildings is that um, I know you're not familiar, Mr. Engineer, with, with historic masonry and old brick and old mortar, and you think it's not worth much because it's weaker than, than you're used to, but, but really these old materials, they do have some capacity. Not a huge capacity, but we can save ourselves a lot of money on projects and really do the project right if we incorporate the strengths of that masonry within whatever type of retrofit technique we're looking at. And, and that's why I think, you know, I'm going to talk about external methods and some other techniques, but, but some of my favorite approaches that incorporate the inherent strength of masonry are injection techniques, using internal reinforcement to, to effectively turn an old historic masonry building into more like a modern reinforced masonry system and post-tension repairs. And we'll, we'll see how each of those work. You've seen this image before, right? You've seen all this, this slide, almost exactly the same slide already. Um, I'm showing it again because it's such a hugely important concept. When we're strengthening old masonry, we have to be very careful to use materials that have compatible properties in terms of strength, stiffness, thermal response, vapor transmission, do not introduce dissimilar materials. And, and, and you know, I, I talked about this already from a repointing standpoint, but it's even more important, say, if we are strengthening a building. And, you know, as engineers, we know, we talked about stiffness and, and how uh, stiff sections attract loads. Uh, if you look at a typical or sometimes non-typical uh, historic masonry wall system, you will usually have pretty good construction on the outside of that wall, whether that's a face brick or a cut stone or a dress stone. The interior wise of the wall, however, could be built very differently, right? They could be poorly coursed, uh, maybe rubble fill uh, areas in, in between the exterior wise, and, and what that does to your stress distribution across the wall section is this, and I've, I've drawn in here really how the loads get transferred between these different layers of wall. The very stiff facings take most of the load. This internal rubble filled area is not doing much work. Well, if we can make this internal rubble filled do the same amount of work as the facing walls, you know, we've, we've just increased the capacity of our wall section. There are right ways to do this. Say if we're using an injection approach, to fill in the voids with a compatible uh, with a high strength fill that high strength fill will attract loads and over time you'll get a, dis a disproportionate amount of load going to that very strong very stiff center wide that if you use say an epoxy or a modern high cement content repair material um, what we're after with, with a compatible base repair is using materials that have the same strength and stiffness approximately throughout the entire wall section. So we get a nice even stress distribution. That's the best thing we can do for our wall system. So keep that in mind as we go through, through and talk about different strengthening and stabilization approaches. I don't need to talk about parapet bracing because Al, Al did a great job. You know, he talked all about, uh, you know, the braces that were in place, these parapets, but parapet bracing is a very common uh, repair approach uh, you know, the parapets that exist on our historic buildings are very vulnerable to lateral loads, whether that's a wind load or an earthquake load. And, and simple uh, uh, external steel bracing, connecting the parapet to the roof is a very effective way 
uh, of, of strengthening that parapet, and very simple approach. Another very common uh, strengthening method that, that you'll see all over the place with, with older buildings is using this external anchors to tie the floor diaphragms and the roof diaphragm to the exterior walls. We've seen this already today, but external patris plates, um, you can use plates. If you don't want to see those plates on the outside of the wall system, you can also use some of these grouted or epoxy anchors we showed already um, that are, are just a blind anchorage into the wall. These connections between walls and floors are very, very important. We like our walls, or our buildings rather, to behave like a box type system rather than a loose assemblage uh, of separate elements. So these connections, very important and a very common type of strengthening approach. Here's a good little trick that you can use. Um, sometimes if you analyze walls and you look at the resistance to lateral loads, wind loads, you'll find, well, the stresses don't, don't check out. What do you do? You can't really make the material stronger. You can add to the wall section, put some reinforcement in, or you can reduce the effective height of the wall. So by installation, some simple kicker braces from the wall back to the, the roof diaphragm, we've just reduced the effective height of that wall. We've effectively taken the top three feet off of that wall. And sometimes that's enough. Sometimes that's enough strengthening so that you don't have to do anything else internal to the wall system. Um, I'm not a big fan of reinforced overlays. You, uh, we see it a lot in the seismic zones when we're doing seismic retrofits out on the West Coast. Um, maybe it's a shot creed or a concrete overlay. Uh, we're here to talk about historic preservation. We don't want to use this approach because you're effectively covering up the wall system. And here we see a very, very heavy rebar mesh that's tied to the exterior of a wall. They're going to come back and shot creed, actually put a layer of concrete over this wall system. And, and Inherently, it has some problems as a strengthening approach because uh, in earthquake zones, the loads that our walls see are driven by the mass of the building, the weight of the building. If you're adding mass of these walls, this concrete overlay, sometimes this can be eight inches or 10 inches thick. That's a lot of extra mass. That means a lot of extra load you have to design for. Uh, there are some more elegant approaches. You know, one simple approach, in, 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 in lieu of a, a, a reinforced concrete overlay, you can install external steel frame systems. Not a bad approach. Um, they don't add a lot of mass to the wall system. Of course, they, they do change the appearance of your wall system. You're not going to see the same appearance as you would uh, before the, this, this steel brace system was installed. But, but here you see a series of steel tubes really just as strong backs, stiffening this wall to take lateral loads. It's not a terrible approach. It's good from the standpoint that if you have a better idea in the future, if you've got a better budget in the future, you can do something different. Um, you can remove these external steel braces without much problem. Uh, internal diagonal braces, another very common approach that's used, uh, we use it all the time. Uh, to increase, say, the lateral strength of a building. And we see, you know, as building usage transitions through the years, say from a, a, maybe it was a, a, a building with very, very frequent cross walls and shear walls, those walls may have been taken out to open up internal spaces here, a furniture showroom. You have to do something to take the place of the walls that were removed. In this case, simple diagonal braces can do the trick. Um, Steel frame systems, one thing to think about if you're installing or designing a steel frame system to interact or to strengthen an historic masonry building, number one, you've got to think about how you're going to get that steel frame inside the wall, inside the building, rather. Uh, here's a steel frame system that was used to strengthen a, a, a church tower, and the entire system was built with relatively short segments, you know, 10-foot length long sections that were brought in one piece at a time through the window openings, and then bolted together. Another important thing to think about is how those frames get connected to the exterior walls. Um, very commonly, our old historic buildings, they weren't always built with perfectly square walls. Or maybe those walls have moved a little bit over time. So some type of a, an adjustable co connection, an adjustable length. In this case, this was a, a, a threaded rod with a coupler nut. And that, that nut could be threaded in and out and move that attachment plate in and out to, to adjust for any difference from one spot to the ne next as that frame system was connected to the wall. 
adjustable attachments. Um, kind of a unique external approach and something that it, it, it's, it's, it's really interesting is using external post-tensioning rods. Um, post-tensioning is just the act of, of using compression forces I'm using, and also using the compression capacity of the stone and of the brickwork uh, uh, to resist lateral loads. In this case, this, this, this is a building in New Zealand, actually, University of Canterbury uh, campus, and it was strengthened to resist very, resist very high seismic loads, and you can't really see, unless you look close, you can't see the system. If I circle it, here, here I've circled all the post-tension elements, thin metal rods. Okay, with an anchorage block here and here. And by cranking on those metal rods, they're just threaded at the ends, and by applying a force, you can imagine how, how that, that post-tension force is literally holding that building down to the foundation. And what I thought was really innovative in this case, this was on a building we designed, we just were touring it, uh, um, they installed a horizontal system of post-tension rods as well. Anchorage at one end, at the other edge of the end of the building as a means to, to really just crank things together. So we talked about using masonry's uh, 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 inherent properties to your advantage. Masonry has a very good compression capacity. Post-tensioning is great because it takes advantage of that compression response. Um, very effective strengthening technique uh, in this situation. Uh, a common deficiency in a lot of old wall systems is you know, just rocking of the piers if you have a lateral load from wind or earthquake loads. So this vertical post-tension force just cranks down on rods and keeps the, that, or in, increases that, that rocking capacity and keeps those piers from, from rocking over under lateral loads. Is post-tensioning recommended for correcting the problem or just stabilizing? Well, no, as a matter of fact, post-tension, so the question was, can you use post-tensioning to correct a problem or just stabilize? No, you can actually use it to increase the capacity. So uh, if you have an issue where the building has moved, um, to some degree, you can use it to, to stabilize, but it's very effective at increasing lateral capacity. Yeah, very good approach, actually. Um, another common, uh, it's becoming more and more common, I want to say. There are actually some design guides put out now by the American Concrete Institute, is using fiber-reinforced polymers as an overlay to strengthen masonry. I, I don't see a lot of applications for historic construction because this system involves epoxy coating uh, uh, or adhering either fiberglass or carbon fibers to the face of the wall using an epoxy matrix. And um, it's fine, but it, it, the appearance is not what you want with the historic masonry. You're, you're covering up the, the historic appearance of the wall system. But there are situations, say, in basement walls um, and other interior applications where maybe the appearance isn't a primary consideration and, and it may be feasible. So external approaches that we just talked about in general, unless you're epoxy coating, unless you're adhering a strengthening method to the wall, most of the techniques we just talked about are reversible. We like that, right? That's another one of our preservation uh, ph uh, philosophical ob objectives is whatever we do to a historic building should not keep us from doing something else in the future, either by being reversible or by allowing the building to be retreated again in the future. So this reversibility is an important concept. Um, external approaches generally fairly cost effective. They're not very expensive, but they are visible. You can see them. And in some situations, that's just that's simply not acceptable. You, you can't detract from the historic appearance of the wall. So let's look at some internal approaches. Again, we like internal approaches from an historic standpoint because uh, you can't tell they're there. And internal approaches we'll see is just internal strengthening of wall systems. They don't affect appearance, but not easily reversible and generally, in general, more expensive than, than external strengthening approaches. So in its simplest form, external strengthening can take the form of, say, adding vertical reinforcement here at, 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 at a window jam. And um, it's kind of, this is, shows kind of the brute force approach of just cutting a slot in a brick wall putting in a, a, a vertical rebar, you'll rebuild the brickwork around that and, and, and either pour that up with grout as a rebuilding or inject a grout around that rebar. But in essence, you're, you're creating a reinforced element inside a wall system that was previously 
unreinforced. Very, very effective way at, at strengthening um, historic masonry wall systems. And, and there, there are a number of different proprietary systems out there that are used, say, in some of the seismic zones, center core and syntec methods, or and modulock. Um, Syntec and Grunstark make, uh, I guess I, I want to say, remember we talked about these grouted anchors that, that have like a fabric sock around them, like this, this guy. Um, the, uh, the Syntec folks and the Grunstark folks also make a, uh, you know, they'll make anchors 60, 80, 100 feet long that get installed inside masonry walls. And instead of a small diameter bar here, you may have uh, something equivalent to a number six rebar or a one inch diameter bar even. So, so one common uh, 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 internal strengthening approach is, is, as we see here, just installing vertical reinforcement inside our historic walls you know, where it's needed. And typically that's going to be at piers between windows, uh, reinforcing shear walls at the end of the walls, for instance, or below bearing points. So, so how does this system work? Well, um, and I think, I think um, in conjunction with internal reinforcement, you can also use uh, internal post-tensioning systems, okay, as an alternative to the, uh, say, the, the, this uh, reinforced concrete overlay that we saw. Here's, a, here's an approach we used at the Presidio in San Francisco. This was a seismic retrofit project. And the original plan was to come in on the inside of these walls and shotcrete the walls with a, a new eight-inch layer of reinforced concrete. Common approach, it's done all the time in earthquake zones, but, but we were working with a, a really innovative contractor out there that, that um, has, has a unique post-tensioning approach. And, and the approach there was getting up on top of the walls and drilling down, drilling core holes from the top of the wall down into the foundation at piers between windows. These were the vulnerable sections of the wall. And then adding steel, anchoring that to the foundation, and then um, um, introducing a post-tension force into those rods that were anchored into the foundation. And to look at, I think, of, uh, the situation and, and really the process that goes into installing that vertical reinforcement, it's really fascinating. They have special drill rigs that they adjust to just a, a fraction of a degree. It takes a long time to set them up to make sure they're perfectly plumb and they know where that drill is gonna end up 40 feet below. Um, but they'll set a drill rig up on top of the wall and, 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 and physically drill to intercept the foundation. And um, here, here's a nice little detail that shows how the system works. So we've got a wall section here, a core hole drilled. It's, uh, there's an epoxy anchorage in this case into the foundation. But the rest of this hole is not grouted. It's just a, a rod flo floating in the center of this hole. And they have a special connector for connecting the floor diaphragm to the exterior walls. Um, and that vertical, rod, the vertical rod is continuous, actually. And, and you know, sometimes if with, with, say, a low-rise building, a 20-foot uh, tall building, they can, with a crane, just drop a single rod in. Other times they'll use coupler nuts to attach multiple sections down. Um, and, and after the rod's in place and anchored, if the, after the epoxy's cured in the foundation, they'll come in with a, a hollow core ram and, and, and a load frame up on top of the wall and physically just crank down on that bar and tighten up a nut and, and thereby compressing, putting a post-tension force on those piers. And I, and I like one of, the, one of the great things I picked up from this project is the concept of having really a weather cap on top of that anchorage. The nice thing about this is, is that permits you to go back in future years and check your pre-stress or your post-tension load and make sure that, that you've done all the calculations right, or give you the opportunity to um, add additional load in the future. If you get some relaxation, some creep, some loss of those forces over time, you can go back in, take off the weather cap, tighten down your nut again, or, or add an additional load. And it's somewhat reversible because in the future, if you decide that wasn't a very good idea, you, you can just uh, loosen this nut at the top wall and remove that post-tension force. Not as easy to get the rod out of the wall. We haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, you know, I, I tell you what, it, 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 it's not going to work for every situation. Um, I'll show you a little case study. There was a lot of electrical conduit in the wall, and it caused some problems. But you've got to either map that out beforehand, um, 
or come up with some means to, to you know, reroute your electrical around those areas. Most of the time, and, and I remember this building in particular, uh, you know, this was a historic building. They had no conduit inside the wall at all. It was all face mounted. So in this case, we didn't have to worry about it. In other jobs, man, it's been a big issue. Conduit inside walls. Um, it's used commonly for arch bridge strengthening as well, strengthening of historic arch bridges. Um, again, the key here is, is, is drilling at, at a precise angle and laying out your reinforced core holes so that they just kiss the inside of that arch. You know, these are your vulnerable points at the quarter points of this arch, the hinge points of that arch. And by installing a, a reinforced core in this fashion, you actually can increase the load rating of, the, of your bridge and get, get a better capacity um, for truck loads and, and other high, highway type loadings. Um, let's talk about injection for just a moment. We mentioned injection already today when we talked about crack repair, and, and it really is phenomenal. There's some great mixes uh, that have been designed over the years that um, are, are highly fluid. These folks are they're doing a flow test of an injection grout um, using a flow cone. It's kind of like doing a slump test for concrete. You do a flow test to see how long it takes for the material to flow through this cone. Highly fluid mixes, um, and, and, and really they, they've coined a term called CIF, compatible injection fill. The key to the whole process is coming up with a material that has properties similar to, to the host material, that's the brickwork being injected. And I, I think my last, little, my last little thing we can pass around is a little core that got taken out of a, uh, um, let's see, oh, this was, this was from our New Orleans project. And, and look at it up close because you can see the white material. This is what was injected into a void collar joint. It's got just excellent flow and very good bond, no shrinkage. It's really a difficult task to come up with a material that has the right strength, in this case a very low strength, no shrinkage, and good penetration. But it's an effective, it's an effective approach. Um, you can use uh, this injection process whenever you have voids inside a wall that you want filled. Um, we've run into a lot of strange situations over the years, and, and, and it's not uncommon to see rubble fill inside old brick walls or a lot of voids. Um, cracked header brick, you've seen these here. Maybe we need some uh, uh, retrofit anchors to replace the function of those cracked header bricks. Um, injection is effective, though, at filling voids inside a wall, stabilizing multi-wide masonry, displaced wise. Um, and it, to some degree, it's good at keeping water from penetrating walls. Anytime you have a void in your wall, it can attract moisture and allow that moisture to travel within and throughout your wall system. So filling in these voids this is a home in Lawrence, Kansas, actually, um, old Civil War era home. Um, and, and, and really filling in the voids in this wall system was one very important part of a stabilization project. Now, one of the keys if you're, if you're involved in an injection process is um, you have no idea if the voids in that wall have been filled properly, right? The injector drills some holes, maybe pumps in some stuff. He walks away and says, yep, I did a great job. How do you know they've done a good job? Uh, we specify on all our projects some type of follow-up testing, and that could be taking cores out of the wall like you see here. It could be bore scope in, in inspection of the interior, or very commonly using non-destructive methods such as radar scanning. And, and this is uh, a fellow scanning a masonry wall, a brick wall, using a radar device. Really effective radar, microwave radar scanning at finding Metals inside walls are very effective at finding voids. And just like, uh, just like it sounds, it's a radar device. At its base, uh, it, it, the, the basis of the technique is reflections of radar energy off of metals, void spaces, and different materials inside walls. And I've shown here two radar scans, one before injection, one after. And these images may not mean a whole lot to you, but I, I recognize each of these reflections, these different colors, as indicating a void behind the first Y, the masonry, behind the second Y, then deeper in the wall. After injection, the post-injection radar scan should look about like this, almost 100% solid. How big an area is that? Um, this area, this, uh, let's see, this scan, this is actually um, from a single run of a radar antenna down the wall. So the horizontal scan is inches. Uh, this is a six-foot length of wall, 70 inches up to here. 
And on the vertical scale, we're reading the depth into the wall, 5 inches, 10 inches, 15. So it's about, it was about a 4 wide wall, 16-inch wall. Beforehand, afterhand, here's about a 50, 55-inch scan. Yeah, that's a good, well, the question was, what do you do if, if, if your post-injection scan shows voids? And it happens. You know, nobody's perfect. Um, but we de you develop a punch list. And, and the nice thing is, if you think if you've got a void detected with radar, you always follow that up with, say, a borescope survey. You drill in and say, okay, I found a void right here. Well, you'll drill in and look at it with the borescope and say, okay, that is a void, or eh, we blew it on the radar you know, interpretation. Most of the time, uh, post-injection voids are, are nothing more than a, maybe a mortar inclusion or some other material that got encapsulated by the injected grout. But you, know, you do find voids, and you just uh, point out to the contractor, well, here's a spot to re-inject, and they, they follow it up with a, another spot injection, and it's no problem. Is there an acceptable range, an acceptable range of, of flaws? Yes. Yeah, usually in our specs, we will specify... Um, four inch maximum flaw size, um, about the size of your fist after injection. I don't want to see anything larger than that in the wall. And from a practical standpoint, I think it makes sense. But really, the reason we, we, we call out that as our, our maximum permissible flaw size is that's about the smallest thing we can find with radar. You know, you just can't find something the size of your thumbnail with a radar scanner. So those are the void types that are detectable um, inside walls. Uh, let's see, if you indulge, let's see, just for a few minutes, I think in, a, in just a couple minutes we can look at a quick little case study for hurricane strengthening. It's a project we're just wrapping up, uh, work on a whole series of, of the pump stations down in New Orleans. And if you've been to New Orleans, you know New Orleans is below sea level, right? Every time it rains, they have these, these canal systems that collect water and, and huge, massive pumps that lift that water up into other canals that drain into Lake Pontchartrain. And so here's one of the pump stations. We worked on 17 of these buildings there. And the Corps of Engineers, uh, after Katrina, they realized they were very close to losing some of their pump stations due to inadequacies of the historic masonry and resisting hurricane-level loads. And uh, we were under some pretty tight constraints. We had to have a system or a strengthening technique that permitted the pump stations to be fully operational during all the construction work. That meant, really, we couldn't use an internal frame system, something that we'd have to move pumps around and build around. We had to come up with an internal strengthening approach. Um, these walls had conduit, like you're saying, all over through them. They had an incredible amount of machinery and equipment mounted to the inside face of these walls, so we couldn't use an internal technique. The historic commission would not let us put anything on the outside of the building, so what, what the Corps of Engineers designed was an internal strengthening approach. And um, here, here's a typical detail that, that they came up with. Their engineers have new horizontal reinforcement at the floor lines, above windows, at roof lines, and new vertical reinforcement at the piers between windows. This is one of, one of the buildings. This is the power house building. They actually have their own power station to run all the pumps in New Orleans. And, and most of these buildings date from 1898 to about 1910. And it's really, really fascinating to work with and see the types of construction there. Um, now, the internal strengthening that was designed there was pretty incredible. The longest horizontal run was about 150 feet. And the longest vertical run, I think, in this building was maybe 40 feet. Uh, many of the buildings, uh, uh, let's see, back on this one, most of these buildings are about 20 feet tall. And so the vertical core holes were, were, were 20 to 22 feet down into the foundation. And, and um, the contractors, I always thought a, a diamond core drill was a diamond core drill. You just cored and, and that was it. But they, they really were masters. They were, these, these drillers were from the UK, and they developed special diamond segments for the ends of their core barrels. They matched the, core, the, the diamond core segments really with the strength of the brickwork and came up with a dry coring method using compressed air and vacuums to evacuate dust rather than a water-based method because of all the electrical systems that were present in this building. They couldn't use water or risk shorting out the systems. 
And, and looking at from the top of the wall here, some typical core holes, um, series of holes drilled down into the foundation for anchorage. And, and I think one of the innovative uh, approaches there was using a hollow bar that also served as an injection port. So these bars were hollow so that uh, they could inject from the top of the wall. The, the grout material would go all the way down, you know, 20, 25 feet, maybe sometimes up to 40 feet down into the foundation, and then fill up around there from the bottom up, which is what you want. So it was an interesting project. Um, we're going to turn it back over. I appreciate your time. And, and, and one thing I, I did not include in your handout, but I thought it was a good idea sitting here today, are just a couple places you can turn for more information. Most, I think most of our instructors were active in the Masonry Society, a couple of us very active in the Association for Preservation Technology. Both of them are excellent groups that you can turn to for more information. They have publications, they have committees, they have uh, um, conferences and workshops such as this one that, that can get you better educated on dealing with old Masonry if, if you're so inclined, if you're interested. So, um, what's our schedule, guys? What are we going to do now? You're going to have a little chit chat. Okay, so Al's going to talk about moisture intrusion. Any little questions while he's setting things up? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the, the powerhouse is on Carrollton. You know the power complex itself, and you can't miss it if you're driving down Carrollton. It's a, it's a. There are actually a, 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 a several big. Uh, they look like it's something you'd see in a refinery, but the, but just diesel tanks out next to the Carrollton Road, and the powerhouse itself has two stacks coming up. Um, but any of the pump stations, pump station six, pump station seven, pump station one, three, and five are finished. Um, I don't know. You can look at them, but you can't tell anything was done. <laughs> uh, That's the beauty of the process. The, was it seven that, that uh, failed during the um, Pump station seven, no. Pump station seven did not fail. Pump station 17 did. What that was up, the, that's the one I know about. And that one's up north, kind of the northeast part of town. And I tell you, I have not, it was really an interesting study because we've looked at a lot of earthquake damage, and I haven't seen damage like that outside of earthquakes. They, they came, they were really close to losing uh, that pump station altogether. Not, not that you heard it from me, because they don't, they don't like to make that public, but um, really, I don't know, it was really neat damage. It was terrible, yeah. The yeah. 30 feet of water? They were gone. Yeah. It was, a, it was a horrendous situation, and, and, and we all know what happened there. It really wasn't the winds. It was failure of some, some of the canal systems, but um, what they've done now with, with uh, this, this upgrade, they've upgraded these buildings, these historic buildings, to handle uh, 165 mile an hour winds, that's pretty huge, and a four foot flood surcharge. So they've put in all waterproof doors and windows. They can seal up these buildings like bulkheads and, and handle floods of four feet in addition to hurricane level winds. And, and that takes a lot of internal reinforcement and that that's, was the impetus behind the projects. The Corps of Engineers, our client, well, I'll tell you what, um, we worked for a subcontractor. My role in that project really was construction engineering. The Corps of Engineers had a design, and um, it was somewhat novel and somewhat difficult to implement. So I worked with this, a subcontractor that did the coring, did the, did the bars. You know, where do you find bars like this? Um, here's one of the smaller ones. They actually had to buy a device to cold roll threads onto stainless steel tubing. And um, yeah, it really was an interesting project, but um, pretty innovative in terms of what they were doing. With and so the Corps of Engineers hired the sub, the general contractors, and generals hired the subs. And you know, I was pretty far down the food chain myself. Was that innovative design as far as what? Was the, the design was fairly innovative, and again, it's it's maybe maybe from the standpoint that um, it's it was fairly common to see this in the seismic zones and earthquake zones. But um, for hurricane strengthening, it was fairly novel, but very, very effective. They, I mean, they, they, you can do, they really increase the, the lateral capacity of these buildings like you wouldn't believe. Right? They are like bunkers. <laughs> yeah, they could withstand a lot of wind and a lot of, a lot of water. Yeah. Yes, sir.
the storm surge in Katrina. Um, what do you think, Ben? I don't, I don't give you a yeah. Yeah. Well, it was, you know, if, if I remember right, Ben, the, the, the flooding was not caused by the storm surge itself, but the canal system breached and man, it, it, they, they couldn't, you couldn't control it. You couldn't pump the water fast enough, really. Right. Which I think was only about six feet. And he said, he asked me, and I was in my 30s, and he said, do you have any idea what uh, a cubic yard of seawater weighs? It's right under 2,000 pounds. Yeah, seawater is heavy. So if, if you only had a three-foot storm surge, every three feet along that storm surge is like a small car being thrown at your building. Yeah, people, you know, and we were just talking about that in New York because we've been doing some of the, some of the evaluation after... It wasn't even a hurricane, but the tropical storm Sandy, they had a 13-foot storm surge in front of Sandy that hit New York. And I think we, we're, we're calling it a storm surge. Just It doesn't strike fear into people's hearts. We've got to call it something else. Like, like a tsunami we know is destructive. These things are like little tsunamis. And, and 13 foot, that's not even a little tsunami. That's a pretty big tsunami. Um, but storm surges are hugely destructive. Yeah, they last longer, too. Yeah, yeah. Tsunamis don't last as long. Yeah. You're right, because they, they go in and they just the water's up there for a period of hours, right? Al, you gotta tell me. I'm just I'm just killing time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was it, what was the first word there? I missed that. <laughs> oh hold on. One thing that uh, while I'm up here with you, uh, is um, what I'd like to do is just before I go into this next short presentation, ask any of the audience if they have any questions for our, any of our speakers before I give this presentation and close this down. Mike. Oh, at the pump house? Yeah. Yeah. Here's here. Maybe here. I'll just hold this. But um, I don't know. How can I? How can I diplomatically say this was about the worst masonry construction I've ever seen in my life? Um, it was bad. From a strength standpoint, very low fired brick, very soft mortar, and um, they cheated. I mean, they, they just buttered the joints front and back with a little strip of mortar. And, and part of the reason the masonry was such a low strength was not really because the materials are so bad, but there just wasn't enough materials in the wall. So there were a lot of internal voids. And so um, they had blind headers. We talked about those today. They had corroded ties in some buildings, there were, there were retrofit ties, there was grout injection at the walls as well as the internal reinforcement. A lot of voids. Same thing at the UN? That the UN building, um, yeah, it was, you know, and it's common with a lot of buildings of that era, 50s, 60s, 70s, as they were transitioning from massive bearing wall type buildings to like a facade over a backup system. Um, they didn't have a cavity wall in there. They didn't have a drainage cavity, I should say, but it wasn't a massive bearing wall either. It was some kind of mishmash in between. And so there's just a, a no way for more moisture that got in the wall to get out. And um, yeah, so behind the stone facing, there were a lot of voids. Um, that, that, that building is not getting injection. It's just some stainless steel retrofit anchors and, and doing a good job of maintenance, you know, just getting the joints tightened up. That's really what it came down to. If they would have maintained the building over the years, it wouldn't have, wouldn't have been a problem. Um, it was built in, uh, I don't want to say 53, 52, 53 was uh, completion. So they were looking at a, you know, maybe you could call it a 50 year renovation, but over a billion dollars. I wish I could say I got a good percentage of that, but it was, we had such a small role. And, and the problem with our, our role in that was nobody wanted to hear it because the, the, the original evaluation of the building that led to the renovation concentrated on the, the curtain walls and the interior, um, interior um, finishes and also the, the HVAC mechanical electrical systems. Nobody looked at the stone. 
until it was too late. So they didn't have money to fix the stone. And all these things, oh, you found corrosion, we don't want to hear about it. Well, you got to hear about it because these ties are gone. So, um, yeah, it was an instru- it's, it's ongoing. It's almost done. What are you going to talk about? Oh, yes, sir. Oh, paint removal? It actually damaged the surface of the bridge. Right. Or they've gone through and trying to remove the paint. They've like ground the, the paint off and the right. surface of the bridge and stuff like that. And it actually damaged the, the bridge. Uh, maybe next time you all come down here, maybe you get some information on that one. Yeah, paint removal, or, or even if you have like a, a stucco, a cement stucco, or a surface render. Um, usually we see people do that as a response to water penetration problems as a low cost response to addressing it, because really the best thing you can do if you've got a water issue is make sure your joints are tight, do repointing, make sure you, you, you take care of your copings, your tops, your walls, like Al, Al did, um, and, and just and get the wall tight. The paint, um, it's a devil to get off. And sometimes, sometimes you just gotta say, guess what, you get a painted wall. Yeah. You know, because you're gonna damage the, the brick and the mortar way too much trying to get it off. Yeah, but you can. Like yeah, what's here? Oh, you because oh. you got you have some. Thoughts. What you can do is you can take the bricks out and turn them around. You it's can lime based mortar. Take them out, turn them around, put it back. Yeah, you can. Depending do that. on the size of where you're at. Well, if it, you but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you got a budget issue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, that's no, that's a, that's a good thing, and, and there are there are some strategies, as Al, Al said, and uh, we can talk more. I'll be around if you want to talk about some other ideas. Cryo, yeah, the cryo cryo blasting. Have you done it down here? Do you have somebody that does it? Uh, oh, but still, Dallas is close enough. We had a guy in Denver. We had a guy in Denver doing that, and, and it really is an effective approach. But but he he died, and his daughter started running the company, and I think it just just died with him. But. Yeah, you really have to think long and hard about using any kind of abrasive method. Um, yeah, but depending if it's a glazed brick or an adobe brick or something like that. Right. Because then you're getting into different surfaces. Mm-hmm. I'll show you more. All right. That sounds We're good. We're going to take a look at it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Oh, mine. Um, keeping your sanity, working with um, different people who didn't understand exactly what was going on, and that you realize is that you're halfway through it and there's no going back, so you have to go forward. That was the biggest part. Yeah. Well, but, you know, it's kind of like I said, uh, you can't plan for these things nope. 100% ahead of time. You have to be adaptive with these types of projects and, and have to interact and talk with the design team you've got to get guys like this talking to guys <laughs> like you all you know it just has to happen over a glass of wine right i just be. <laughs> just checking just checking it's friday <laughs> it is friday <laughs> yeah speaking of which oh yes <laughs> when I first got here, I lost a lot of weight. I'm serious. I was outside and I was thinking, in the morning, it can't get that hot. And then by the afternoon, and, and your sort of legs are buckling and you think, well, what's, what's, what's happening? And then you realise you're borderline sunstroke. But yeah, it toughened me up. There's no two ways about it. And all you people that lived here before air conditioning and the, the settlers and stuff like that, they were people of character. They had to be. Oh, but I see why people sit under the shades, you know what I mean, in the tree. <laughs> All right.